apologize. We're going to have to interrupt you right there. The House is back live. Made on our democracy. It cannot, however, deter us from our responsibility to validate the election of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. For that reason, Congress has returned to the Capitol. We always knew that this responsibility would take us into the night and will stay as long as it takes. Our purpose will be accomplished. We must and we will show to the country and indeed to the world that we will not be diverted from our duty, that we will respect our responsibility to the Constitution and to the American people. On Sunday, it was a great, my great honor to be sworn in as speaker and to preside over a sacred ritual of renewal as we gathered under this dome of this temple of democracy to open the 117th Congress. I said that as we, as we were sworn in then, we accept a responsibility as daunting and demanding as any previous generation of leadership has ever faced. We know that we're in difficult times, but little could we have imagined the assault that was made on our democracy today. To those who strove to deter us from our responsibility, you have failed. To those who engaged in the gleeful desecration of this, our temple of democracy, American democracy, justice will be done. Today, January 6th, is the Feast of the Epiphany. On this day of revelation, let us pray that this instigation to violence will provide an epiphany for our country to heal. In that spirit of healing, I evoke the song of St. Francis, I usually do. St. Francis is the patron saint of my city of San Francisco, and his song of St. Francis is our anthem. Lord, make me a channel of thy peace. Where there is darkness, may I bring light. Where there is hatred, let us bring love. Where there is despair, let us bring hope. We know that we would be part of history in a positive way today, every four years, uh, when we... Uh, demonstrate, again, the peaceful transfer of power from one president to the next. And despite the shameful actions of today, we still will do so. We will be part of a history that shows the world what America is made of, that these, uh, this assault, this assault is just that. It shows the weakness of those who had to show through violence what their message was. My colleagues, it's time to move on. I, I wear this pin quite frequently. Actually, I gave it to our beloved John Lewis just the weekend before he, weekend or so before he left us. And it's a flag of our country, a flag of the United States of America. On, on it, it says... One country, one destiny. One country, one destiny. Written on the flag. That was also what was embroidered in Abraham Lincoln's coat that he had on that fateful night. Lincoln's party. Lincoln's message. One country, one destiny. So on this holy day of Epiphany, let us pray. I'm a big believer in prayer. Let us pray that there will be peace on earth and that it will begin with us. Let us pray that God will continue to bless America. And with that, let us proceed with our responsibilities to the Constitution to which we have just within 72 hours taken the oath to uphold. But what purpose does the gentleman from Maryland seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I rise in opposition to the objection. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. 
Madam Speaker, it is a sad day in America. It is a wrenching day in America. It, a day, it is a day in which our words and our actions have had consequences of a very, very negative nature. We ought to watch our words and think what it may mean to some. My remarks uh, were written before the tragic, dangerous, and unacceptable actions. And un unacceptable is such a tame word. My remarks started with Madam Speaker. The American people today are witnessing one of the greatest challenges to our democracy in its 2244-year 20, history. Little did I know that this capital would be attacked by the enemy within. I was here on 9-11 when we, we were attacked by the enemy without. We need to all work together to tame and reduce the anger and, yes, the hate that some stoke. What some, not all, Madam Speaker, but some in this House and in this Senate are doing today will not change the outcome of the election, which is the clear and insurmountable victory of President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris. Instead, all they will accomplish is to further the dangerous divisions. This was written before this capital was assaulted. Before this democracy was put aside by thousands. Encouraged by the commander in chief. Instead, all they will accomplish is to further the dangerous divisions, as I said, among our people and energize conspiracy theories stoked by our foreign adversaries, which seek to erode America's confidence in our democracy and our system of free and fair elections. I was here in 2000. I was strongly in favor of Al Gore for president. And my candidate got more votes than the other candidate. His name was George Bush, of course. And one of the saddest days was January 20th of 2001, when uh, our candidate, who won the election in my view, was not elected. But it was also one of the proudest moments of my career, because the greatest power on earth passed peacefully from Bill Clinton to George W. Bush. Not a shot was fired. Nobody assaulted this caucus or this Congress or this chamber because we were not disappointed, no. Because we were not angry, no. Because we believe in democracy. We believe in we the people. And the way the people, one of the speakers, I think it was the senator from Texas, expressed, we're here for the people. If those were the people, we are in a lot of trouble. Our electoral system, our democratic system, however, did not break under the strains 
of the misinformation, the claims of fraud, which court after court after court have dismissed out of hand. Not because there was a little evidence, because there was no evidence. That's why we're the longest lasting constitutional democracy in the world. I hope all of us in this body are proud of that and understand why that's the case. Because, as Dick Gephardt said on this floor many years ago, democracy is a substitute for war to resolve differences. It proved once more than ever beating strong heart that gives life to our republic and our freedoms. That strength, Madam Speaker, is derived in part from our institution and our laws. But most importantly, it is powered by citizens and leaders' commitment to our Constitution. Not just us, we swear an oath. But it's all of America. Barack Obama spoke from that chamber and he said, uh, I'm going to be taking another title next year, citizen. And he was proud to take that. And every citizen needs to protect, preserve, and uplift our democracy. Some today did not do that. Many today. 68 years ago in Springfield, Illinois, Governor Adlai Stevenson gracefully conceded his loss to General Dwight Eisenhower. He said this, in traditionally, it is traditionally American, he told his deeply disappointed supporters, to fight hard before an election. But then he added, it is equally traditional to close ranks as soon as the people have spoken. Not the Congress, not the electors, the people has spoken. That which unites us as American citizens is far greater than that which divides us as political parties. It was another man from Springfield, four score and eight years earlier, who won re-election to the presidency in a national crisis that tested our country and its democratic institutions, who pleaded even in his hour of victory for the same spirit of reconciliation. That was the party of Lincoln. That hasn't happened to this hour. Lincoln said, now that the election is over, uh, he asked, may not all, having a common interest, reunite in a common effort to save our common country? Such is the duty of an American who stands for elections or participates in our politics to be either humble in triumph or gracious in defeat. I've lost some elections, not too many. And I've won a lot of elections. And I hope that I've been gracious in defeat and humble in victory. I hope that I put my state and my country first, not myself. It is clear to all that the outgoing president has not followed the path that Stevenson and Lincoln urged. So we the people, each one of us represents about 750 to 800,000 people, some a few more, less. The people. And they've spoken in the way that our Constitution set for them to be heard by us and by the country. They voted. And they voted pretty decisively. We, the people, together must turn away from divisions and its dangers. The senior member of our body, Don Young from Alaska, spoke the other day when we were sworn in and said, ladies and gentlemen of this house, we are so divisive that it's going to destroy our country. We need to reach out and hold one another's hands. We all have a title that we honor more than any other. Perhaps parent, perhaps husband, but we are all Americans. Not Americans are, not Americans D. We are Americans. Let us hope today that 
tonight that we act like Americans, not as D's and R's, but as Americans. Just as Al Gore, just as uh, Hillary Clinton, just as Adlai Stevenson, just as Abraham Lincoln, who had won that election, of course. But he had defeated people, and he said, that's not the issue. The issue is to reunite. We the people must again be the strong heart of our American democracy. We the people on this day in Congress must be agents of unity and constructive action to face the grave threats that confront us and tell those who would assault our capital that is not the American way. And we, the members of Congress, who swore an oath before God to preserve and protect the Constitution of the United States and our democracy, must do so. Now, I don't usually read Senator McConnell's speeches, but I'm not speaking as a Democrat, nor was he speaking as a Republican. Just a few hours ago, We're debating a step that has never been taken in American history, whether Congress should overrule the voters and overturn a presidential election. He went on to say that he supports a strong state-led voting reform. The Constitution, he said, gives us here in Congress a limited role. We cannot simply declare ourselves a national board of elections on steroids. The voters the courts, and the states, the voters, the courts, and the states have all spoken. Five people said the election of 2000 was over. We didn't agree with them. But Al Gore said, we are a nation of laws. Five people. Yes, they were members of the Supreme Court, but they were five people said the election is over. And I sat on that podium and saw that power transfer to George W. Bush. McConnell went on to say, if we overrule them, it would damage our republic forever. He said that, McConnell, the Republican leader in the Senate, about two hours ago, three hours ago, now four hours. He went on to say, if this election were overturned by mere allegations from the losing side, our democracy would enter a death spiral. He concluded it would be unfair and wrong to disenfranchise American voters and overrule the courts and states on this extraordinarily thin basis. And I will not pretend such a vote would be a harmless protest gesture. How presciently he spoke. People who think that the election has been stolen, there's some fraud. Why do they think it? Because the commander in chief said so. And they respect him and they follow him. And words matter. Repeat as he ended, I will not pretend such a vote would be harmless protest gesture while relying on others to do the right thing. I will vote to respect the people's decision and defend our system of government as we know it. I urge my colleagues to vote no on this objection. As McConnell said, a danger to our democracy. And I yield back the balance of my time. Okay. You should accept the Republican vote of five. For what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? I rise for the point of personal privilege to address the House for five minutes. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank Leader you, Madam Speaker. Five minutes. I rise to address what happened in this chamber today and where do we go from here. The violence, destruction, and chaos we saw earlier was unacceptable, undemocratic, and un-American. It was the saddest day 
I've ever had as serving as a member of this institution. The Capitol was in chaos. Police officers were attacked. Guns were drawn on this very floor. A woman tragically lost her life. No one wins when this building and what it stands for are destroyed. America and this institution is better than this. We saw the worst of America this afternoon. Yet in the midst of violence and fear, we also saw the best of America. It starts with our law enforcement, the Capitol Police, the National Guard. The FBI, the Secret Service, who faced the most difficult challenges but did their duty with confidence and strength. Many of them are injured right now. And it also extends to this chamber where both Democrats and Republicans showed courage, calm, and resolve. I'd like to recognize the members now who helped to hold the line. Mark Wayne Mullen. Tony Gonzalez, Jason Crow, Pat Fallon, and Troy Nails. Working with the Capitol Police, they ensured the floor of this chamber was never breached. These are the heroes among us. Thank you for this side of the page. Looking back on the past few hours, it is clear this Congress will not be the same after today. And I hope it will be the better. I hope not just this institution, but I hope every American pauses for that moment and thinks among themselves that we can disagree with one another but not dislike each other. We can respect the voices of others. There's many times we debate on this body, and we should. There's many times we can get heated. I still consider Stinney Hoyer a very good friend. There's times I get upset. I'll call him at home to express what things I may not see fair or just. But that's the way we should handle things. The majority leader is right. We are all Americans first. But should we also think for a moment, what do we put on social media? What do we convey to one another? Just because you have a personal opinion different than mine, you have a right to say it. But nobody has a right to become a mob. And we all should stand united in condemning the mob together. We solve problems before our nation, not through destruction, but through debate. That is the heart of this democracy. I know what we debate today is tough, but it's just, it's right. This isn't the first side of the aisle that's ever debated this issue. I thought what Madam Speaker said back in 2005, this is democracy at its best when they talked about a presidential election in Ohio. These are the moments that we should raise the issue about integrity and accountability and accuracy in our elections. But you know what we should do, the next difference? Not just raise the issue, but work together to solve the problems. Now is the moment. Now is the moment to show America we can work best together. I will tell you, 
The size of the majority is slim, so it gives us the opportunity to make that happen. The only thing that can hold us back is the will of one another to do it. This side of the aisle always believes in working with anybody who wants to move it forward. That does not mean that we're going to agree 100% of the time. That does not mean our voice cannot be heard. That does not mean we cannot be treated fairly. We should be. That may mean on the size of committees. That means on our ability to offer an amendment. That means on our ability to have our voice. But at the end of the day, it helps us come to a better conclusion. By returning here to complete the work, we were sent to do, we are proving that our democracy cannot be disrupted by criminal behavior. We will not falter, we will not bend, and we will not shrink from our duty. <laughs> Let me be very clear. Mobs don't rule America. Laws rule America. It was true when our cities were burning this summer, and it's true now. When, America, when Americans go to bed tonight, their lasting memory should not be a Congress overrun by rioters. It must be a resolute Congress conducting healthy debate. We may not disagree on a lot in America, but tonight we must show the world that we will respectfully but thoroughly carry out the most basic duties of democracy. We will continue with the task that we have been sent here to do. We will follow the Constitution and the law and the process for hearing valid concerns about election integrity. We'll do it with respect. We will respect your opinion. We will respect what you say. And we're willing to listen to it. I think the nation will be better for it on both sides of the aisle. Let's show the country the mob did not win. We have a job to do it. Let's do it with pride. And let's be better when the sun rises tomorrow. With that, I yield back, Madam Speaker. For what purpose does the gentleman from Arizona seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I rise in opposition to the objection. Over the no last objection. few hours, we have seen the consequences of dangerous un-American rhetoric, an armed insurrection against the seat of government of the most powerful country on earth, a breach of this Capitol building to attack Congress, something that has not taken place since the British occupied this building during the War of 1812, an attempted coup spurred by rhetoric coming from those who are looking out for themselves not country. And it is stunning, Madam Speaker, that there are some in this House who have vo voiced support for what happened. It was not a protest. It was treason. It was sedition. And it should be prosecuted as such. At its root, <laughs> at its root is a disease that has infected our politics, one that will make some political leaders do anything including lie and incite violence to hold on to power. That's what we're seeing before our very eyes. In contesting the outcome of this election, my Republican colleagues make contradictory argument that puts party and power before country. They argue the election results were valid when it showed they won their races, but the same ballots were somehow fraudulent when it produced a result President Trump did not like. Keep the results we like, they demand. Cancel the one we don't. That's not how democracy works. And neither is armed insurrection. Here's the truth. Arizona has a long bipartisan record of conducting safe, secure, and fair elections. And I say that as someone whose party has more often than not been on the losing end of those elections. This last election was once again safe and secure. And I commend our state and county election officials, public servants on both sides of the aisle for making Arizona proud once again. We are here because the case that Republicans have brought before us has failed in court over and over and over again. My colleagues say, let's go back to the state. Let them decide. 
My friends, Arizona has spoken. They have sent the correct electors. Arizona's Republican Attorney General, one of the most partisan in the country, said, quote, there is no evidence, there are no facts that would lead anyone to believe the election results will change, unquote. The Republican Speaker of our State House has told us he doesn't like the results of the election, but they are the right results. Joe Biden has won Arizona. The state Supreme Court, made up entirely of justices appointed by Republican governors, they have spoken too. The court said the president's challenge, quote, fails to present any evidence of misconduct, illegal votes, or that the Biden electors did not in fact receive the highest numbers of votes for office, end quote. Look to the words of one of the, president, the president's own campaign chairs in my state, our governor, Doug Ducey. Our governor, he loves the president. He's been so loyal. He made sure the president could hold large rallies in our state in the middle of a pandemic. The governor personally attended them. They spoke so often that the governor gave the president a special hail to the chief ringtone on his phone. After election day, as the legal challenges played out, the governor kept quiet. But when the truth became clear, even he acknowledged, quote, Joe Biden did win Arizona, unquote. And I'm grateful that in this instance, the governor put law, not partisan politics first. And I urge my colleagues in the House to follow his lead. Each and every one of us in this house, the people's house, swore an oath to preserve, protect, and defend our constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Over the last few hours, we have gained a better understanding of what that means. The future of the Constitution, the most precious of the founding documents of the greatest democracy humankind has ever known, is in our hands. Defending democracy is not and should not be a partisan task. It is a sacred one. Right here, right now, we must recognize that fidelity to the founding principles of our nation are not about loyalty to one man but rather to ensure that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. The world is watching us all right now. We must, must get it right. Reject this ill-conceived Ill attack on our democracy. I yield back. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Jim. For what purpose does the gentleman from, gentlewoman from New York seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I rise to support the objection. The gentlewoman is recognized for five minutes. Madam Speaker, I rise with a heavy heart. This has been a truly tragic day for America, and we all join together in fully condemning the dangerous violence and destruction that occurred today in our nation's capital. Americans will always have the freedom of speech and the constitutional right to protest, but violence in any form is absolutely unacceptable. It is anti-American and must be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Thank you to the heroic United States Capitol Police, and thank you to the bipartisan professional staff of the United States Capitol for protecting the people's house and the American people. This hallowed temple of democracy is where generations of Americans have peacefully come together to face our nation's greatest challenges, bridge our deepest fissures, and create a more perfect system of government. This is the appropriate place we stand to respectfully and peacefully give voice to the people we represent across our diverse country. The representatives of the American people in this house are standing up for three fundamental American beliefs. The right to vote is sacred, that a representative has a duty to represent his or her constituents, and that the rule of law is a hallmark of our nation. And in the spirit of healing, those are not my words, those are the words of you, Madam Speaker, from this very chamber, 
when some of my colleagues and friends across the aisle objected to the 2005 Electoral College certification. In fact, there were objections on this floor to the certification of nearly every Republican president in my lifetime. In 1989, in 2001, in 2005, and in 2017. So history is our guide that the people's sacred house is the appropriate venue for a peaceful debate. And this peaceful debate serves as a powerful condemnation to the violence that perpetrated our Capitol grounds today, the violence that was truly un-American. Today's discussion is about the Constitution, and it is about the American people, but it must also be about clearly and resolutely condemning the violence that occurred today. I am honored each and every day to represent New York's 21st Congressional District, and I believe it is my solemn and sacred duty to serve as their voice and their vote in the People's House. Tens of millions of Americans are concerned that the 2020 election featured unconstitutional overreach by unelected state officials and judges ignoring state election laws. We can and we should peacefully and respectfully discuss these concerns. In Pennsylvania, the state Supreme Court and Secretary of State unilaterally and unconstitutionally rewrote election law, eliminating signature matching requirements. In Georgia, there was constitutional overreach when the Secretary of State unilaterally and unconstitutionally gutted signature matching for absentee ballots and, in essence, eliminated voter verification required by state election law. In Wisconsin, Officials issued illegal rules to circumvent a state law passed by the legislature as the Constitution requires that required absentee voters to provide photo identification before obtaining a ballot. And in Michigan, signed affidavits document numerous unconstitutional irregularities. Officials physically blocking the legal right of poll watchers to observe vote counts the illegal counting of late ballots, and hand stamping ballots with the previous day's date. My North Country constituents and the American people cherish the Constitution, and they know, according to the Constitution, elected officials closest to the people in state legislatures have the power of the pen to write election law, not unelected bureaucrats, judges, governors, or secretaries of state. To the tens of thousands of constituents who have reached out to me, thank you. Please know that I'm listening and I hear you, both those who agree and those who disagree. Our constitutional republic will endure this tragic day because the founding fathers understood Congress and the American people would face unprecedented and historic challenges by debating them on this very floor. I believe that the most precious foundation and the covenant of our republic is the right to vote and the faith in the sanctity of our nation's free and fair elections. And we must work together in this house to rebuild that faith so that our elections are free, fair, secure, and safe, and most importantly, that they are Gentlemen, according to the United States expired. Constitution, and I yield back. Thank you. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? I rise in opposition to the objection, Madam Speaker. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Madam Speaker, today the People's House was attacked, which is an attack on the Republic itself. There is no excuse for it. A woman died, and people need to go to jail. And the President should never have spun up certain Americans to believe something that simply cannot be. I applaud... I applaud House leadership of both parties for bringing us back to do our job, which is to count the electors and no more. The problem we face, though, is even bigger. We are deeply divided. We are divided about even life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the words which used to bind us together. Now, at times, tear us apart because we disagree about what they even mean. My constituents at home in Texas are genuinely upset, I say to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle of a constant barrage of those who wish to remake America into a socialist welfare state, efforts to attack our institutions, tear down statues, erase our history, defund our police. We've seen the debasing of our language. We teach our children that America is evil. We destroy our sovereignty and power cartels. We attack our Second Amendment. We've destroyed small businesses. 
through lockdowns. We divide ourselves by race, and we can't even agree that there is man and woman, and we extinguish the unborn before they even have a chance to see daylight. But at the heart of our path forward lies the essence of our republic, its cornerstone, that we are a union of states bound together for common defense and economic strength, and more so bound together through federalism in which we may live together peaceably as citizens in this vast land, agreeing to disagree, free to live according to our own beliefs and according to the dictates of our conscience. Now, many of my colleagues were poised this afternoon to vote to insert Congress into the constitutionally prescribed decision-making of the states by rejecting the sole official electors sent to us by each of the states of the union. I hope they will reconsider. I can tell you that I was not going to, and I will not be voting to reject the electors. And that vote may well sign my political death warrant, but so be it. I swore an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States, and I will not bend its words into contortions for personal political expediency. Number one, rejecting the electors certified to Congress by sovereign states violates the 12th Amendment and the entirety of the Constitution it amends. Notwithstanding claims that you must read certain sections first, it is clear, it is black and white, we count. It is ministerial. And our only job is to count the electors before us. We have only one slate of electors per state sent to us under color of law and no more. Number two, to the extent you believe we do have constitutional authority to reject we are arguing using incomplete and often misleading data points to prove it. I am not afforded time to go point by point, but there are more misleading claims than legitimate ones. Three, rejecting the electors ignores the founder's specific admonition that Congress not choose the president, as articulated in Federalist 68. Indeed, in number four, fourth point, the founders drafted the inclusion of a phrase specifically putting Congress into the manner of the election process then specifically rejected it. Five, if more than a trivial block of this body votes to reject a sovereign state's electors, it will irrevocably empower Congress to take over the selection of presidential electors. And doing so will almost certainly guarantee future houses will vote to reject the electors of Texas or any of our states for whatever reason. Six, voting to reject the electors is not remotely consistent with our vote on Sunday, a vote I forced to highlight the very hypocrisy to accept the outcome of the election of ourselves through elections conducted under the same rules by procedures put in place by the same executive branch officials Im impacted by rulings from the same judges, state and federal. To do so is entirely inexplicable on its face. The argument for rejection most given by my colleagues is based on the allegations of systemic election abuse by executive or judicial branch officials interfering with the legislatures thereof in Article II. Many states made poor policy decisions. Whether these poor policy decisions violate state law is a contested matter and a matter for the states to resolve for themselves. More, five of the six legislatures are controlled by Republicans. Not one body has sent separate electors. Not one body has sent us even a letter by a majority of its whole body. The only body, the Pennsylvania Senate, who managed to come up with a majority of Republicans to complain only did so yesterday in an 11th hour face-saving political statement. Not one GOP statewide official has formally called on us to change. Not one law enforcement organization, state or federal, has presented a case of malfeasance. History will judge this moment. Let us not turn the last firewall for liberty we have remaining on its head in a fit of populist rage for political expediency, when there's plenty of looking into the mirror for Republicans to do for destroying our election systems with expansion of mail-in ballots. I may well get attacked by this. But I will not abandon the my oath to the, the Constitution. Has expired. And I will make clear that I'm standing up in defense of that Constitution to protect our Federalist order and the Electoral College, which empowers the very states we represent to stand and the, the long arm of the federal expired. government. Sorry. I submit this respectfully and humbly. <laughs> Emma, that's different. For what purpose does the gentleman from Alabama seek recognition? I rise in support of the objection. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Madam Speaker, for years, Democrats and their media allies deceived America about Trump-Russian collusion and the extent of foreign interference in the 2016 elections. Yet in 2020, Democrats promoted massive foreign interference in American elections by helping illegal aliens and other non-citizens vote in American elections. 
thereby canceling the votes of and stealing elections from American citizens. Won't evidence exhibit A? In 1993, Democrats rammed through Congress the National Voter Registration Act, making it illegal, illegal, to require proof of citizenship that prevents illegal aliens and non-citizens from registering to vote. Why did Democrats do that? Simple, to steal elections, of course. Exhibit B, how bad is the non-citizen voting problem? In 2005, Democrat President Jimmy Carter's Commission on Federal Election Reform warned that, quote, non-citizens have registered to vote in several recent elections, end quote, and recommended that, quote, all states should use their best efforts to obtain proof of citizenship before registering voters, end quote. Exhibit C, a June 2005 General Accountability Office report discovered that up to 3% of people on voter registration lists are not U.S. citizens. Exhibit D, in 2008, electoral study surveyed 339 non-citizens, 8% admitted voting in American elections. As an aside, I have seen higher percentages in other studies. Exhibit E, the 2010 census counted 11 million illegal aliens in America. Exhibit F, a 2018 Yale study estimated as many as 22 million illegal aliens in America. Exhibit G, the math means between 880,000 and 1.72 million illegal aliens illegally voted in the 2020 elections. Exhibit H, in 2014, Old Dominion University and George Mason University professors surveyed non-citizens and illegal aliens and found they vote Democrat roughly 80% of the time. Exhibit I, the math is again straightforward. The 60% Biden advantage times the illegal alien voting number means Joe Biden gained roughly 1,032,000 votes from illegal alien voting. That's the high number. Exhibit J, while no one knows for sure how massive the illegal alien voting bloc is, we do know Joe Biden and his campaign believed it large enough and critical enough to winning the presidential race that at the October 22nd presidential debate, Joe Biden publicly solicited the illegal alien block vote by promising, quote, within 100 days, I'm going to send to the United States Congress a pathway to citizenship for over 11 million undocumented people. Ladies and gentlemen, Madam Speaker, that is the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for illegal aliens. Joe Biden knew exactly what he was doing by seeking the illegal alien block vote. After all, on May 11, 1993, then-Senator Joe Biden voted for the National Voter Registration Act that makes it illegal to require proof of citizenship from illegal aliens and other non-citizens when they seek to register to vote. Madam Speaker, the evidence is compelling and irrefutable. Non-citizens overwhelmingly voted for Joe Biden in exchange for the promised amnesty and citizenship, and in so doing, helped steal the election from Donald Trump, Republican candidates, and American citizens across America. Madam Speaker, in my judgment, if only lawful votes cast by eligible American citizens are counted, Joe Biden lost and President Trump won the Electoral College. As such, it is my constitutional duty to promote honest and accurate elections by rejecting Electoral College vote submissions from states whose electoral systems are so badly flawed as to render their vote submissions unreliable, untrustworthy, and unworthy of acceptance. Madam Speaker, I yield the remainder of my time to the opposition. Uh, gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from New York State seek recognition? Madam Speaker, as a proud Republican, I rise in opposition to the objection to the electors. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Madam Speaker, I come to this side of the aisle 
as a proud Republican, but most importantly, as a proud American. Today we saw an assault on our democracy. I love this institution. I love the United States Congress. And I love the United States of America. And what I saw today was mob rule that spat upon the blood of my father that is in the soil of Europe and in the soil of Korea. And who gave us, through that blood, this sacred constitution and the sacred ability to lead this world as a power that says, we settle our differences not with mob rule, we settle our differences through elections. And when those elections are over, we have a peaceful transition of power. Now make no mistake to my colleagues on the Democratic side of the aisle, I will be passionate in my disagreement with you. I will be passionate in my ideas for the future of this country. And I will fight for my Republican ideas that I hear, hold near and dear. But I will stand with you tonight and send a message to the nation and all Americans that what we saw today was not American and what we see tonight in this body shall be what we do in America. And that is to transfer power in a peaceful way. And with that, I yield to my best friend in Congress and a Democrat, Josh Gottheimer, my co-chair of the Problem Solvers Caucus. I think. Um, so I thank my friend for yielding and for standing with me and with all of us. Tom Reed is my co-chair of the Problem Solvers Caucus. He's a Republican and I'm a Democrat. When it comes to policy views, we often disagree, but at the end of the day, we are united as Americans. My good friend like me always puts country first. Today, a group of lawless thugs sought to upend the Constitution and the peaceful transition of power because they didn't like the outcome of the presidential election. So they tried to nullify it using improvised explosives, shattering windows, breaking down doors, injuring law enforcement, and even tearing down the American flag that rises above this beacon of democracy. But their attempt to obstruct democracy failed. Their insurrection was foiled. The American people and the greatest democracy the world has ever known won. Abraham Lincoln, who served in this very body, famously said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. That's why for the sake of this country, we must stand together, united, and celebrate a peaceful transition of power. In 14 days, President-elect Biden will be sworn in and despite all of our differences, I have faith that for the American people, we will come together. Democrats and Republicans committed to unity, civility, and truth. We will recognize our higher purpose to help America through these dark days. That is the only way we will beat COVID, rebuild our economy, and stand up to threats at home and abroad. Working together as Democrats and Republicans, I know our best days will always be ahead of us. I yield back. Madam Speaker, I encourage my colleagues to always search their conscience and their souls. And I respect my Republican colleagues and my Democratic colleagues. But today, let us pause and remember what happened here today. Let us pause that our tenure in this Congress will far surpass the time that we stay here. And that will let us pass and cast our votes today, recognizing that what we do here today will set the course of this institution for years to come. And this institution, Madam Speaker, shall not fail, because the United States of America shall forever be the beacon of hope, the inspiration to all, and may God bless our great country. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from New York seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I rise in support of the objection.
Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My constitutional oath is sacred, and I have a duty to speak out about confirmed, evidence-filled issues with the administration of the 2020 presidential election in certain battleground states. Signature verification, ballot observation, voter roll integrity, voter ID requirements, and ballot collection protections were weakened on top of the millions of mailboxes that were flooded with unrequested mail-in ballots. Many of my constituents have been outraged and demanding that I voice their objections here today. This debate is necessary because rogue election officials, secretaries of state and courts circumvented state election laws. They made massive changes to how their state's election would be run. These acts, among other issues, were unlawful and unconstitutional. Congress has the duty to defend the Constitution and any powers of state legislatures that were usurped. Some claim today's objections set new precedent by challenging state electors. That claim, of course, ignores that Democrats have objected every time a Republican presidential candidate has won an election over the past generation. If you don't have any objections today, that's your call, but don't lecture about precedent. Over the past four years, Democrats boycotted President Trump's inauguration and State of the Union addresses, pushed the Trump-Russia collusion conspiracies and investigations and knowingly lied about it, voted to impeach the president before even knowing what to impeach him for, and then actually passed the articles of impeachment before Senate Democrats voted to remove him from office. Today's debate is necessary, especially because of the insistence that everything President Trump and his supporters say about the 2020 election is evidence-free. That's simply not true. No one can honestly claim it's evidence-free when I say that in Arizona, courts unilaterally extended the legislatively set deadline to register to vote. The Arizona State Senate issued subpoenas post-election to get information from the Maricopa County Board on various election matters. But the board and the courts refused to help at all to let the state Senate complete its constitutional duties. In Pennsylvania, where state legislators wrote us about their powers being usurped, the Democrat majority on the state Supreme Court changed signature, signature matching and postal marking requirements. The date to submit mail-in ballots was extended, contradictory to the date set by state law. The state legislature expanded no-excuse mail-in balloting without a constitutional amendment. Constitutions apply to the acts of all branches of government. The issue was magnified by the voter rolls being so inaccurate that more voters submitted ballots than they were registered voters. Signature authentication rules for absentee and mail-in ballots were weakened by the Democrat Secretary of the Commonwealth without authorization. Ballot defects were allowed to be cured in some counties, but not others. There were poll watchers denied the ability to closely observe ballot counting operations. In Georgia, the Secretary of State unilaterally entered into a settlement agreement with the Democratic Party, changing statutory requirements for confirming voter identity. Challenging defective signatures was made far more difficult, and the settlement even required election officials to consider issuing training materials drafted by an expert retained by the Democratic Party. In Wisconsin, election officials assisted voters on how to circumvent the state's voter ID laws and signature verification laws, while also placing unmanned drop boxes in locations picked to boost Democrat turnout. The Democracy in the Park event in Wisconsin had over 17,000 ballots transferred that shouldn't have been. These are all facts, and certainly not evidence-free. Americans deserve nothing less then full faith and confidence in their elections, and a guarantee that their vote, their voice counts, and that their concerns are being heard. That's why we need to have this debate today, whether you like it or not. This isn't about us. This is about our Constitution, our elections. This is about our people and our republic. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Arizona seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I rise in opposition to the objection. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Madam Speaker, I am the proud son of immigrants. 
Growing up, I heard stories about parties, politicians, and presidents invalidating elections from the people that took power for themselves. That's why when I joined the Marine Corps, the most sacred part of my oath was to protect the Constitution of the United States. I never thought I would have to do that on the floor of Congress. But here we are. The people have spoken, and the power of the people, the Constitution, will be preserved. Madam Speaker, I left my youth. I left my sanity. I left it all in Iraq for this country. Because there was this one precious idea that we all had, that we all believed that this country was going to protect everyone's individual rights, that you're going to be able to vote, that you're going to be able to preserve democracy and pass it on as a legacy, as an inheritance to every American. But today, today there was treason in this house. Today there was traitors in this house. So I'm not asking my Republican colleagues to help me and stop this objection to Arizona. I'm asking you to get off all these objections. It is time for you to save your soul. It is time for you to save your country. That man at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue will forget you. He will use you and he will dump you to the side. But what will be left will be the stain, the stain of democracy that you are engaging in right now. Listen to yourselves. I consider most of you very smart, believe it or not. But the idea that we would rig an election for the president, but not preserve the congressional seats for all of our friends that we just lost in the last election is absurd. The idea that we would help Vice President Biden win, but wouldn't make sure that we got enough senators in the Senate for us to pass a full agenda is absurd. The idea that there is somehow nefarious voter registration in Arizona that tipped the scale, when because during that same time of voter registration, there were more registered voters that were Republican than Democrats. You are better than this. Many of you did serve. Many of you have never served. But there is an opportunity and a time for courage. I hope you never have to face fire or bullets or bombs for your country. But right now, right now, this country is asking you to be better. Right now, this country is asking you to show courage. That man will leave. Your soul will stay with you for the rest of your life. You owe it to democracy. You owe it to the hundreds and thousands of men and women that have sacrificed their life. You know better. You are better. Be the good American. Be the American you want. Preserve this democracy. Reject this movement. And stop this terrorism that is happening from the White House. I yield back my time. Members are reminded to redirect their remarks to the chair. What purpose does the gentleman from North Carolina seek recognition? Thank you, Madam Speaker, to speak in favor of the objection. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Madam Speaker, it's been quite a day. And in contrast to the gentleman's comments just now, I couldn't get over this uh, text that I received from the mayor of Charlotte, Vi Lyles, about 30 minutes ago. She is a progressive Democrat, political opponent for years, tremendously graceful person. She said, Representative Bishop, I hope you're safe and well. It must have been a day of anguish for the world to see our Capitol buildings under siege. I know you have a long night ahead and want you to know I was thinking about you, your family and staff. God bless, Vi. Back home, the generosity of spirit still exists. Um, and I understand uh, the sharp words and feelings on the other side tonight. But there are also good people back home. And I've heard from many, many, many of them. And news would suggest there are millions of Americans. That's a big number. Millions, tens of millions who believe something went awry in this election. And they aren't dumb. They aren't mindless. Uh, they don't believe things simply because the president says them. There were problems. I know that Joe Biden will be president. 
but I don't know that it hurts or would hurt any of us to have the generosity of spirit to continue to reflect on what might be better or what might seriously have gone wrong here, even if you reject the notion that the result was wrong. I'd like to offer a slightly different perspective, a distinct perspective. Perhaps it will be rejected. I think if I were sitting on the other side of the aisle, it would be very difficult for me to listen to tonight. But you all have heard it said, and it certainly is true, that many executive branch officials around the nation departed from state legislatures, enacted laws. I think it's less understood how this came to pass. It was not a spontaneous, independent decision-making, but it resulted, I would argue, from a coordinated nationwide partisan plan. And the fact and scope of the plan, it really isn't disputed. If you go to democracydocket.com, it is the website of Mark Elias, the National Democratic election lawyer, who appeared in hundreds of cases across the country in the course of the election year. Um, this plan was not a response to COVID, by the way. It preexisted that, and his website shows that as well. He explained that in January 2020. It was a chaos strategy, a plan to flood state and federal courts with hundreds of simultaneous election year lawsuits aimed at displacing state legislative control. Now, as I've seen it, only the most experienced and independent judges appear to have recognized what was afoot. In the Fourth Circuit, dissenting judges Wilkinson and Agee said this, let's understand the strategy that is being deployed here. Our country is now plagued with a proliferation of pre-election litigation. And as they put it, 385 election year cases to that point on October 20th. And they referred to the, elections, the website healthyelections.org to verify that. Around the country, they wrote, Courts are changing the rules of the upcoming elections at the last minute. It makes the promise of the Constitution's elections and electors' clauses into a farce. This was a political operation masquerading as a judicial one. And in keeping with that, it featured gross breaches of litigation ethics, forum shopping, repetitive suits after losses, and collusive settlements with cooperating Democratic officials of state and local governments. That, ladies and gentlemen, is, is what led to officials changing the rules in state after state, mainly through consent orders or the preliminary unreviewed decisions of state and federal trial judges inclined by partisanship or having limited experience with the electors clause. In turn, the displacement of rules set by state legislatures led to chaotic conditions on the ground about which so many Americans are angry and disheartened. I think we can do better. I think that strategy was unwise. And I think, particularly in light of what's happened here today, we should. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The gentleman's time has expired. For, so for what purpose does the gentleman from Arizona seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I rise tonight in opposition to the objection. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Speaker. As a nation, we have endured trying times and overcome many challenges. And now we face an unprecedented effort to ignore the will of the American people and the people of Arizona. Given the facts, the unprecedented events of tonight, this effort must be finished and America has to be, can be united again. That is going to take leadership. We are all leaders. We are elected to be leaders. And if we're going to do that, we have to do it from the respect to others. The idea that truth is important, that factual content is important, that we're going to tell the American people what is going on in this country and not what we hope they hear from a 30-second soundbite. I used to be a homicide investigator. My job was to follow the facts, develop a case, make decisions and recommendations based on where those facts led me. Following the process means that decisions cannot be made on rumors and innuendos alone. 
I am proud to say that Arizona has used mail-in voting for over two decades. Both Republicans and Democrats have long been proud of how our state has administered elections. In 2020, over 65% of eligible Amer Arizonans voted in record number. Our Republican governor, Republican Attorney General, Democratic Secretary of State, and our state's election administrators and volunteers worked with integrity to administer a fair election. We saw a turnout increase in both Republican and Democratic areas, and in fact, more Republicans registered this election than any other party. I am proud that many of our tribal, rural, and underserved communities voted in record numbers all during a pandemic. In 2020, Arizona's made their voices heard. The fact is, multiple federal state judges, agencies, state elected officials concluded the winner was Joe Biden. In Arizona, this process was administered and overseen by officials from both parties. Elections officials conducted random, hand-counted audits of many precincts. They confirmed there were no errors that would change the result of the election. The fact is that the Republican chairman of Maricopa County, the largest Republican county in the state, the biggest population county, he stated more than two million ballots were cast and there was no evidence of fraud or misconduct or malfunction. He concluded, no matter how you voted, this election was administered with integrity, transparency, and in accordance with state laws. The fact is, the president and his campaign and several Republican-led groups filed eight election lawsuits, all of which were dismissed. The Arizona Supreme Court, a body where all justices have been appointed by Republican governors, unanimously dismissed the case. The justices found that the party had failed to present any evidence of misconduct or illegal votes let alone establish any degree of fraud or a significant error rate that would undermine the certainty of the election results. After these judicial rulings, I, the governor said, I trust our election system. There's integrity in our election system. The fact is Joe Biden is the certified winner of Arizona's 11 electoral votes. Arizona's elected and appointed officials from both parties followed the facts and came to this conclusion. I urge my colleagues to do the same. To my colleagues across the aisle, I know we may disagree on who we want as president, but what we personally want is not what matters here. Rather, the people's influence, as reflected in the certified electoral college results, is what matters. Facts matter. Undermining faith in our election process by attempting to mislead the American public only serves to weaken us and make us vulnerable to foreign, foreign actors who would do us harm. For the good of our country, this must stop. Now is the time to come together to preserve our de democracy and to protect our national security. I know my constituents are looking to Congress to move past its divisions, find common ground, and pass legislation to improve the lives of struggling families. We must say, stay focused on fighting the pandemic. We must work to ensure all Americans can be vaccinated as soon as possible so we can save American lives, safety, re safely reopen schools, get people back to work, and visit loved ones again. I urge my colleagues to follow this, and Madam Speaker, I yield. Gentlemen's time has expired. Yeah. What purpose does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I rise to claim time in support of the objection. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes with that objection. Madam Speaker, one of the first things we did when the House convened today was to join together to extend our grace and our kindness and our concern for a colleague who has experienced just an insurmountable amount of grief with his family. And I want all of our fellow Americans watching to know that we did that because we care about each other and we don't want bad things to happen to each other and our heart hurts when they do. Now I'm sure there are plenty of folks over there who don't like me too much and there are a few of you 
that I don't care for too much, but if anybody had been hurt today, it would have been even more of a catastrophe than we already saw, and I think that's an important point for the country. Another important point for the country is that this morning, President Trump explicitly called for demonstrations and protests to be peaceful. He was far more, you can moan and groan, but he was far more explicit about his calls for peace than some of the BLM and left-wing rioters were this summer when we saw violence sweep across this nation. Now, we came here today to debate, to follow regular order, to offer an objection, to follow a process that is expressly contemplated in our Constitution. And for doing that, we got called a bunch of seditious traitors. Now, not since 1985 has a Republican president been sworn in, absent some Democrat effort, to object to the electors. But when we do it, it is the new violation of all norms. And when those things are said, people get angry. Now, I know there are many countries where political violence may be necessary, but America is not one such country. Madam Speaker, it was wrong when people vandalized and defaced your home. It was wrong when thugs went to Senator Hawley's home. And I don't know if the reports are true, but the Washington Times has just reported some pretty compelling evidence from a facial recognition company showing that some of the people who breached the Capitol today were not Trump supporters. They were masquerading as Trump supporters and, in fact, were members of the violent terrorist group Antifa. Now, we should seek to build America up, not tear her down and destroy her. And I am sure glad that at least for one day, I didn't hear my Democrat colleagues calling to defund the police. Now, I appreciate all the talk. Now, I appreciate all the talk of coming together, but let us not pretend that our colleagues on the left have been free of some anti-democratic impulses just because we signed on to legal briefs and asked courts to resolve disputes. There were some on the left who said that we should not even be seated in the body, that we ought to be prosecuted, maybe even jailed. Those arguments anger people, but people do understand the concepts of basic fairness. And no competition, contest, or election can be deemed fair if the participants are subject to different rules. Baseball teams that cheat and steal signs should be stripped of their championships. Russian Olympians who cheat and use steroids should be stripped of their medals. And states that do not run clean elections should be stripped of their electors. This fraud was systemic. It was repeated. It was the same system, and I dare say it was effective. We saw circumstances where when Democrat operatives couldn't get the outcomes they wanted in state legislators, when they couldn't get the job done there, they went and pressured and litigated and usurped the Constitution with extra constitutional action of some officials in some states. They fraudulently la laundered ballots, votes, voter registration forms, and then they limited review. In 2016, Democrats found out that they couldn't beat Donald Trump at the ballot box with voters who actually show up, so they turned to impeachment and the witness box. And when that failed, they ran to the mailbox, where this election saw an unprecedented amount of votes that could not be authenticated with true ID, with true signature match, and with true confidence for the American people. Our Article III courts have failed by not holding evidentiary hearings to weigh the evidence. We should not join in that fa failure. We should vindicate the rights of states. We should vindicate the subpoenas in Arizona that have been issued to get a hold of these voting machines, and we should reject these electors. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Colorado seek recognition? in opposition to the objection. That objection, the gentlewoman is recognized for five minutes. Madam Speaker, I'm very pleased to yield my time to the Dean of the Arizona Delegation, Mr. Grijalva. Thank Gentleman you. is recognized.
Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank the gentleman, lady from Colorado for yielding time. I'll be very brief, Madam Speaker. There's really nothing left to say. This ch challenge brought by uh, members of uh, this House, Republican members from this House from Arizona, and a senator from Texas, uh, the whole discussion today, this challenge to the electoral, 11 electoral votes that are designated for President Biden and Vice President Harris, the discussion today proved there is no merit to denying those electoral votes. There's no legal standing. The courts have proven that in Arizona time and time again. There is no precedent. There is no constitutional violation. But we're here today, Madam Speaker, because of, the, uh, because of one man and those who uh, are desperate to please him. So what do we have to show for this process today? Fear, a lockdown, violence, and regrettably and sadly death, arrests, present and real danger, threats, and assault on our institution, this House, this Congress, and the very democracy that we practice here. And to what end? What did we accomplish? The reality is that the challenge will be defeated come January 20th. President Biden and President Harris will be the President and Vice President of the United States. So what have we accomplished? To further divide this nation, to continue to fan the same rhetoric of division and us versus them, to paralyze and dismantle our democracy? Is that what we're attempting to accomplish today? The mob that attacked this institution, I hold no member specifically responsible in, for that madness that was around us. But we do share a responsibility, my friends, to end it. It's past time to accept reality, to reaffirm our democracy, and move on. Help, I would urge my colleagues from Arizona who filed this challenge to withdraw their challenge to this to Arizona and to the electors that have been chosen to, to, to give their 11 votes to the winners in that election. But if that doesn't happen, then I would urge my colleagues to reject this challenge and uh, defend all voters, defend the voters of Arizona and that democracy that we practice daily in the representation of our constituents. That's what's at stake today. And with that, I yield back to the gentlelady from Colorado and, and thank her for the time. I thank the gentleman. Madam Speaker, on Sunday, every member in this chamber took an oath to uphold the Constitution. And there's only one vote tonight for those who took that oath. And that vote is to reject this challenge. I yield back. All the time for debate has expired. The question is, shall the objection to the Arizona Electoral College vote count submitted by the gentleman uh, from Arizona, Mr. Gozar, and the senator from Texas, Mr. Cruz, be agreed to? Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. No. And you know the chair, the noes have it. Speaker. For what purpose does the gentleman uh, from Ohio seek recognition? We would ask for a roll call. The yeas and nays have been requested pursuant to Section 3S of House Resolution 8. The yeas and nays are ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device and are to reminded to vote when their group is called.
The House now voting on whether to uphold a Republican objection to Arizona's Electoral College vote that was certified by the state in favor of Joe Biden. The objection was raised earlier this afternoon when Congress was in a joint session, forcing the House and Senate to meet separately to debate the issue. The debate was soon interrupted when the U.S. Capitol was placed on lockdown after rioters protesting the election results breached security and stormed the building. Once order was restored, lawmakers returned to finish the debate. Chair will address the chamber. Today, a shameful assault was made on our democracy. It cannot, however, deter us from our responsibility to validate the election of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. For that reason, Congress has returned to the Capitol. We always knew that this responsibility would take us into the night and will stay as long as it takes. Our purpose will be accomplished. We must and we will show to the country and indeed to the world that we will not be diverted from our duty, that we will respect our responsibility to the Constitution and to the American people. On Sunday, it was a great, my great honor to be sworn in as speaker and to preside over a sacred ritual of renewal as we gathered under this dome of this temple of democracy to open the 117th Congress. I said that as we, as we were sworn in then, we accept a responsibility as daunting and demanding as any previous generation of leadership has ever faced. We know that we're in difficult times, but little could we have imagined the assault that was made on our democracy today. To those who strove to deter us from our responsibility, you have failed. To those who engaged in the gleeful desecration of this, our temple of democracy, American democracy, justice will be done. Today, January 6th, is the Feast of the Epiphany. On this day of revelation, let us pray that this instigation to violence will provide an epiphany for our country to heal. In that spirit of healing, I evoke the song of St. Francis. I usually do. St. Francis is the patron saint of my city of San Francisco, and his song of St. Francis is our anthem. Lord, make me a channel of thy peace. Where there is darkness, may I bring light. Where there is hatred, let us bring love. Where there is despair, let us bring hope. We know that we would be part of history in a positive way today, every four years, uh, when we uh, demonstrate, again, the peaceful transfer of power from one president to the next. And despite the shameful actions of today, we still will do so. We will be part of a history that shows the world what America is made of, that these, uh, this assault, this assault is just that. It shows the weakness of those who had to show through violence what their message was. My colleagues, it's time to move on. I, I wear this pin quite frequently. Actually, I gave it to our beloved John Lewis just the weekend before he, weekend or so before he left us. And it's a flag of our country, a flag of the United States of America. On, on it, it says, one country, one destiny. One country, one destiny. Written on the flag. That was also what was embroidered in Abraham Lincoln's coat that he had on that fateful night. Lincoln's party, Lincoln's message, one country, one destiny. So on this holy day of Epiphany, let us pray. I'm a big believer in prayer. Let us pray that there will be peace on earth, 
and that it will begin with us. Let us pray that God will continue to bless America. And with that, let us proceed with our responsibilities to the Constitution to which we have just within 72 hours taken the oath to uphold. But what purpose does the gentleman from Maryland seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I rise in opposition to the objection. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Madam Speaker, it is a sad day in America. It is a wrenching day in America. It, a day, it is a day in which our words and our actions have had consequences of a very, very negative nature. We ought to watch our words and think what it may mean to some. My remarks uh, were written before the tragic, dangerous, and unacceptable actions. And un unacceptable is such a tame word. My remarks started with Madam Speaker. The American people today are witnessing one of the greatest challenges to our democracy in its 244-year history. Little did I know that this capital would be attacked by the enemy within. I was here on 9-11 when we were attacked by the enemy without. We need to all work together to tame and reduce the anger and, yes, the hate that some stoke. What some, not all, Madam Speaker, but some in this House and in this Senate are doing today will not change the outcome of the election, which is the clear and insurmountable victory of President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris. Instead, all they will accomplish is to further the dangerous divisions. This was written before this capital was assaulted. Before this democracy was put aside by thousands. Encouraged by the Commander-in-Chief. Instead, all they will accomplish is to further the dangerous divisions, as I said, among our people and energize conspiracy theories stoked by our foreign adversaries, which seek to erode America's confidence in our democracy and our system of free and fair elections. I was here in 2000. I was strongly in favor of Al Gore for president. And my candidate got more votes than the other candidate. His name was George Bush, of course. And one of the saddest days was January 20th of 2001, when uh, our candidate, who won the election in my view, was not elected. But it was also one of the proudest moments of my career, because the greatest power on earth passed peacefully from Bill Clinton to George W. Bush. Not a shot was fired. Nobody assaulted this caucus or this Congress or this chamber. Because we were not disappointed? No. Because we were not angry? No. 
because we believe in democracy. We believe in we the people. And the way the people, one of the speakers, I think it was the senator from Texas expressed, we're here for the people. If those were the people, we are in a lot of trouble. Our electoral system, our democratic system, however, did not break under the strains of the misinformation, the claims of fraud, which court after court after court have dismissed out of hand. Not because there was a little evidence, because there was no evidence. That's why we're the longest lasting constitutional democracy in the world. I hope all of us in this body are proud of that and understand why that's the case. Because, as Dick Gephardt said on this floor many years ago, democracy is a substitute for war to resolve differences. It proved once more than ever beating strong heart that gives life to our republic and our freedoms. That strength, Madam Speaker, is derived in part from our institution and our laws. But most importantly, it is powered by citizens and leaders' commitment to our Constitution. Not just us, we swear an oath. But it's all of America. Barack Obama spoke from that chamber and he said, uh, I'm going to be taking another title next year, citizen. And he was proud to take that. And every citizen needs to protect, preserve, and uplift our democracy. Some today did not do that. Many today. 68 years ago in Springfield, Illinois, Governor Adlai Stevenson gracefully conceded his loss to General Dwight Eisenhower. He said this, in traditionally, it is traditionally American. He told his deeply disappointed supporters to fight hard before an election. But then he added, it is equally traditional to close ranks as soon as the people have spoken, not the Congress, not the electors, the people have spoken. That which unite us as American citizens is far greater than that which divides us as political parties. It was another man from Springfield, four score and eight years earlier, who won re-election to the presidency in a national crisis that tested our country and its democratic institutions who pleaded even in his hour of victory for the same spirit of reconciliation. That was the party of Lincoln. That hasn't happened to this hour. Lincoln said, now that the election is over, uh, he asked, may not all, having a common interest, reunite in a common effort to save our common country. Such is the duty of an American who stands for elections or participates in our politics to be either humble in triumph or gracious in defeat. I've lost some elections, not too many. And I've won a lot of elections. And I hope that I've been gracious in defeat and humble in victory. I hope that I put my state and my country first, not myself. It is clear to all that the outgoing president has not followed the path that Stevenson and Lincoln urged. So we the people, each one of us represents about 750 to 800,000 people, some a few more, less. The people, and they've spoken in the way that our Constitution set for them to be heard by us and by the country. They voted. And they voted pretty decisively. We, the people, together must turn away from divisions and its dangers. The senior member of our body, Don Young from Alaska, 
spoke the other day when we were sworn in and said, ladies and gentlemen of this house, we are so divisive that it's going to destroy our country. We need to reach out and hold one another's hands. We all have a title that we honor more than any other, perhaps parent, perhaps husband, but we are all Americans. Not Americans R, not Americans D. We are Americans. Let us hope today that tonight that we act like Americans, not as D's and R's, but as Americans. Just as Al Gore, just as uh, Hillary Clinton, just as Adlai Stevenson, just as Abraham Lincoln, who had won that election, of course. But he had defeated people, and he said, that's not the issue. The issue is to reunite. We the people must again be the strong heart of our American democracy. We the people on this day in Congress must be agents of unity and constructive action to face the grave threats that confront us and tell those who would assault our capital that is not the American way. And we the members of Congress who swore an oath before God to preserve and protect the Constitution of the United States and our democracy must do so. Now, I don't usually read Senator McConnell's speeches, but I'm not speaking as a Democrat, nor was he speaking as a Republican. Just a few hours ago, we're debating a step that has never been taken in American history, whether Congress should overrule the voters and overturn a presidential election. He went on to say that he supports a strong state-led voting reform. The Constitution, he said, gives us here in Congress a limited role. We cannot simply declare ourselves a national board of elections on steroids. The voters, the courts, and the states, the voters, the courts, and the states have all spoken. Five people said the election of 2000 was over. We didn't agree with them. But Al Gore said, we are a nation of laws. Five people. Yes, they were members of the Supreme Court, but they were five people said the election is over. And I sat on that podium and saw that power transfer to George W. Bush. McConnell went on to say, if we overrule them, it would damage our republic forever. He said that, McConnell, the Republican leader in the Senate, about two hours ago, three hours ago, now four hours. He went on to say, if this election were overturned by mere allegations from the losing side, our democracy would enter a death spiral. He concluded it would be unfair and wrong to disenfranchise American voters and overrule the courts and states on this extraordinarily thin basis. And I will not pretend such a vote would be a harmless protest gesture. How presciently he spoke. People who think that the election has been stolen, there's some fraud. Why do they think it? Because the commander-in-chief said so. And they respect him and they follow him. And words matter. Repeat as he ended, I will not pretend such a vote would be harmless protest gesture while relying on others to do the right thing. I will vote to respect the people's decision and defend our system of government as we know it. I urge my colleagues to vote no on this objection. As McConnell said, a danger to our democracy. And I yield back the balance of my time. We should accept Republicans at all five.
For what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? I rise for the point of personal privilege to address the House for five minutes. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank Leader you, Madam Speaker. Five minutes. I rise to address what happened in this chamber today and where do we go from here? The violence, destruction, and chaos we saw earlier was unacceptable, undemocratic, and un-American. It was the saddest day I've ever had as serving as a member of this institution. The Capitol was in chaos. Police officers were attacked. Guns were drawn on this very floor. A woman tragically lost her life. No one wins when this building and what it stands for are destroyed. America and this institution is better than this. We saw the worst of America this afternoon. Yet in the midst of violence and fear, we also saw the best of America. It starts with our law enforcement, the Capitol Police, the National Guard. The FBI, the Secret Service, who faced the most difficult challenges but did their duty with confidence and strength. Many of them are injured right now. And it also extends to this chamber where both Democrats and Republicans showed courage, calm, and resolve. I'd like to recognize the members now who helped to hold the line. Mark Wayne Mullen. Tony Gonzalez, Jason Crow, Pat Fallon, and Troy Nels. Working with the Capitol Police, they ensured the floor of this chamber was never breached. These are the heroes among us. Thank you for this side of praise. Looking back on the past few hours, it is clear this Congress will not be the same after today. And I hope it will be the better. I hope not just this institution, but I hope every American pauses for that moment and thinks among themselves that we can disagree with one another but not dislike each other. We can respect the voices of others. There's many times we debate on this body, and we should. There's many times we can get heated. I still consider Stinney Hoyer a very good friend. There's times I get upset. I'll call him at home to express what things I may not see fair or just. But that's the way we should handle things. The majority leader is right. We are all Americans first. But should we also think for a moment, what do we put on social media? What do we convey to one another? Just because you have a personal opinion different than mine, you have a right to say it. But nobody has a right to become a mob. And we all should stand united in condemning the mob together. We solve problems before our nation, not through destruction, but through debate. That is the heart of this democracy. I know what we debate today is tough, but it's just, it's right. This isn't the first side of the aisle that's ever debated this issue. I thought what Madam Speaker said back in 2005, this is democracy at its best when they talked about a presidential election in Ohio. 
These are the moments that we should raise the issue about integrity and accountability and accuracy in our elections. But you know what we should do, the next difference? Not just raise the issue, but work together to solve the problems. Now is the moment. Now is the moment to show America we can work best together. I will tell you, the size of the majority is slim, so it gives us the opportunity to make that happen. The only thing that can hold us back is the will of one another to do it. This side of the aisle always believes in working with anybody who wants to move it forward. That does not mean that we're going to agree 100% of the time. That does not mean our voice cannot be heard. That does not mean we cannot be treated fairly. We should be. That may mean on the size of committees. That means on our ability to offer an amendment. That means on our ability to have our voice. But at the end of the day, it helps us come to a better conclusion. By returning here to complete the work, we were sent to do, we are proving that our democracy cannot be disrupted by criminal behavior. We will not falter, we will not bend, and we will not shrink from our duty. <laughs> Let me be very clear. Mobs don't rule America. Laws rule America. It was true when our cities were burning this summer, and it's true now. Yeah. When, America, when Americans go to bed tonight, their lasting memory should not be a Congress overrun by rioters. It must be a resolute Congress conducting healthy debate. We may not disagree on a lot in America, but tonight we must show the world that we will respectfully but thoroughly carry out the most basic duties of democracy. We will continue with the task that we have been sent here to do. We will follow the Constitution and the law and the process for hearing valid concerns about election integrity. We'll do it with respect. We will respect your opinion. We'll respect what you say. And we're willing to listen to it. I think the nation will be better for it on both sides of the aisle. Let's show the country the mob did not win. We have a job to do it. Let's do it with pride. And let's be better when the sun rises tomorrow. With that, I yield back, Madam Speaker.
The yeas are 121, the nays are 303, the noes have it, the objection is not agreed to, and without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. The clerk will now notify the Senate of the action of this House, informing that body that the House is now ready to proceed in joint session with the further counting of the electoral vote for the president and the vice president. To remind both sides of the aisle, during the joint session, there are 11 House Republicans, 11 House Democrats, 11 House Senate Democrats, 11 Senate Republicans, 44 members on the floor. Please view the proceedings from your offices. Thank you. Example to the public of how serious we take the coronavirus threat and the need for social distancing. Please, my colleagues, if you are not having a participating in the next part of this, please return to your offices.
And as you heard Speaker Pelosi say, the House has rejected the objection to the electoral vote certification for Arizona. So therefore, those 11 electoral votes have been awarded to Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. The Senate also rejected it, 93 to 6. 82 House Republicans voted against the objection. 122 House Republicans voted for it. The House is letting the Senate know what they just did. The Senate will be coming back over to the House chamber, walking across the Capitol, to the House chamber, and then they will rejoin the joint session and start working their way th through the states. Up next is Arkansas, followed by California and Colorado. Now the next state that's coming up where there was a potential objection noted was in Georgia. So that will be coming up and then potentially Pennsylvania as well. But they've gone through three states now. Three states have been certified, Alabama, Alaska, and then Arizona, which at 2.15 this afternoon was interrupted, and that's what they were just finishing. So the joint session will continue in just a minute. The House is waiting for the Senate members to come back into joint session. They have not gaveled out at this point, as they usually do during this part, from potentially a cleaning break or something like that, but uh, they seem to be staying in session. So we wanted to keep keep the program going tonight. And joining us once again today is Niels Lesniewski. He's a senior reporter with CQ Roll Call. Mr. Lesniewski, for those viewers who maybe haven't been with us all day, where did your day start? So I've, I've had the... Uh... I suppose good fortune for myself of having been working uh, from home today as part of our uh, effort to keep down the number of journalists who are operating out of capital, the capital because of the pandemic. Uh, and so my, my job today was designed to be um, largely looking at aggregating the feeds that were coming in from my colleagues uh, who were in the Capitol uh, building for the purposes of basically monitoring what we thought was going to be a fairly predictable proceeding uh, with some objections and some votes and maybe it would take a while and maybe we'd still be going at 11 p.m. or midnight. Uh, but at the end of the day, it seemed like it was going to be a fairly predictable uh, afternoon and evening of sort of piecing together what was going on in the Capitol. Uh, it turned out that was what I ended up doing today, but certainly the, uh, the circumstances changed mightily, uh, as you say, around uh, 2 o'clock when it became clear that the uh, Capitol building itself was going to be breached. Uh, and was breached, and and then ultimately we had these these mobs of protesters that ended up uh, overtaking both the House and the Senate floors. So, at two two o'clock this afternoon, what were you hearing from your colleagues on the Hill? Well, so what we what we initially heard uh, was that there were reports that there would be a lockdown going into effect, uh, and there was some commotion. Uh, on both uh, the House and the Senate floors with, with people being hurried out, particularly key officials like uh, Vice President Mike Pence, uh, some of the House leaders. We had a report fairly early on that both Steny Hoyer, uh, the House Majority Leader, and some of the other House leaders were being uh, hustled away. At one point in time, there was actually a, um, a Capitol Police officer uh, on the rostrum in the House, uh, making an announcement that there was going to be a lockdown. Uh, and that was where we knew that things were, were getting out of hand. We could see the pictures from outside, obviously, and we, we knew of, of people who were out uh, with the demonstrators. But we didn't expect, I don't think anybody really expected, that they would not only get uh, as close as they did to the carriage entrances and the other doors to the Capitol, uh, but that they would actually be able to break windows and actually break into the physical building. So the Arizona debate is now finished. Arizona's electoral votes have been certified as they've been rejected by both the House and the Senate. What happens 
First of all, listening to the speeches in the House and the Senate, what did you hear that you want to comment on? Well, there was a sort of interesting change in tenor from the ones that had taken place uh, before uh, the violence of this afternoon, you know, uh, uh, the attempted failed insurrection, I, I guess you would call it, that uh, before that, things were going according to plan. Afterwards, there were a couple of senators, uh, I was mainly watching the Senate debate this evening, and there were a couple of senators who talked about uh, ben Sass and uh, Rand Paul coming to mind immediately, who said they had speeches that they had planned to give this afternoon that were completely, basically non-operable, would have sounded completely out of tune with the fact that there had actually been an insurrection attempt in the middle of the day. Uh, and so I think that that was sort of the, the remarkable quick adjustment that everybody was making from something that seemed like a hypothetical that maybe someday if if Congress this time were to start rejecting electoral votes, then someday there could be some sort of a, a violent scene in the Capitol building to, oh, no, it happened today. Uh, and so I think that was sort of the the most jarring part of some of the speeches uh, that took place this evening. Mr. Lesniewski, I don't know if you were, you said you were monitoring mainly the Senate, and one of the speeches given tonight was by Lindsey Graham. And what uh, Senator Graham had to say was, Trump and I, we've had a hell of a journey. I hate it to end this way. Oh my God, I hate it. Did you hear that? I did, and and Senator Graham, of course, has has been sort of gone full circle with President Trump. You know, he, he ran uh, for president himself uh, in 2016. I can remember uh, an event he was doing in his home state of South Carolina, where I want to say I was one of two reporters who were not from South Carolina who were in the room. And he maybe only got a couple dozen constituents of his own uh, to show up. Uh, from that and the incident where President Trump read out his telephone number in the primary process to being one of his closest allies really on the cap in the Capitol, someone who he would he would play golf with uh, not infrequently. Uh, I think that this sort of the sort of uh, coming around and back around to the other side again, perhaps uh, for Senator Graham uh, was kind of remarkable to hear how quickly the flip, the switch flipped this evening. A couple of uh, questions before we go back to the House. Um, there's been some talk in a lot of social media comments about the 25th Amendment. What are you hearing? Well, so the, the 25th Amendment question, whether or not uh, Vice President Pence and, and the majority or the bulk of the cabinet uh, would sort of set aside the presidency of Donald Trump uh, temporarily, presumably for the remainder of the, the president's term, uh, it, seems one of, it seems unfathomable, and I would have said this morning it would have been unfathomable, but you know, we, we have to see, I think, what President Trump does in the next sort of 24 hours. When this process concludes, uh, what are we finding out that he intends to do or attempts to do between now and noon on January 20th? If he sort of literally or figuratively sort of goes away, whether it's it stays in the White House and doesn't do anything, or he actually gets on an airplane and goes to Mar-a-Lago and spends the, the remaining time in Florida, uh, then maybe we don't technically have to see a, a debate about the 25th Amendment. But certainly, uh, if there were to be a repeat of the rally that he did this morning uh, outside the White House or near the White House, that sort of seemed to be the green light for the uh, group of protesters and the mob that then was going to the Capitol building, then I don't think anything is out of the question uh, in the next week, uh, week and a half. Okay, Niels Lesniewski, we're gonna go back to the House here in two seconds, but very quickly, will there be more objections tonight, do you think, Georgia and Pennsylvania specifically? 
we expect Pennsylvania at least, but there may be a deal to sort of truncate the debate time uh, on on that Pennsylvania objection. So we might see the Senate quickly walk across the building and then relatively quickly be back uh, in the House. I don't know if it'll be another uh, two hour break. Niels Lesniewski, CQ Roll Call. I hope we can check in with you again later tonight. The House is about to be joined by the Senate for the joint session as the Electoral College certification continues. Up next is the state of Arkansas.
And the joint session between the House and the Senate is about to begin as they continue their electoral vote certification process. They've gone through three states so far, Arizona being the last. There was an objection to the Arizona certification, which was rejected. Arkansas, California, and Colorado are the next states that are coming up. The House is currently waiting on 11 Democratic senators and 11 Republican senators to walk across the Capitol to the House chamber, along with Vice President Pence, who will join Speaker Pelosi on the dais, and then they will continue the process of certification. As we heard from Niels Lesniewski of CQ Roll Call, there's potentially a challenge to the Pennsylvania certification coming up, but there may be some operating going on so that the two-hour debate period is not uh, used and it's a, a quicker process. So given that we are waiting for the Senate to come over, join the House, as Speaker Pelosi said, 11 Republicans in the House, 11 Republicans in the Senate, 11 Democrats in the House, 11 senators, uh, Democratic senators may be on the floor uh, for the House rules uh, because of the COVID prevention uh, rules. And that should begin very shortly. The Senate should be working its way into the House chamber very shortly. So this will go on for another couple hours. They'll go through each state and certify the electoral vote or object to the electoral vote. If there is an objection, a reminder that both a member of the House and a senator have to sign the objection. So there was talk earlier prior to this afternoon and the breach of the Capitol that Georgia could also be uh, objected to. Uh, senator Leffler, uh, who was defeated yesterday in her, re in her election bid, she's filling the seat um, of a senator who, who uh, resigned. So it was a special election, was going to object to Georgia, but the word right now is that that probably will not happen. The Vice President of the United States Senate.
The joint session of Congress to count the electoral vote will resume. The tellers having taken their seats, the two houses retired to consider separately and decide upon the vote of the state of Arizona to which an objection has been filed. The Secretary of the Senate will report the action of the Senate. In the Senate of the United States, ordered that the Senate, by a vote of six ayes to 93 nays, rejects the objection to the electoral votes cast in the state of Arizona for Joseph R. Biden for president and Kamala D. Harris for vice president. The clerk of the House will report the action of the House. Order that the House of Representatives rejects the objections to the electoral vote of the state of Arizona. Pursuant to the law, Chapter 1 of Title III of the United States Code, because the two houses have not sustained the objection, the original certificate submitted by the state of Arizona will be counted as provided therein. The tellers will now record and announce the vote of the state of Arkansas for president and vice president in accordance with the action of the two houses. This certificate from Arkansas, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state, and that is annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Arkansas seems to be in regular, in, seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received six votes for president, and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received six votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of Arkansas that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none. Hearing none. This certificate from California, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state, and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of that state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of California, I would say the great state of California, seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr., the state of Delaware, received 55 votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris, of the state of California, received 55 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the state of California that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none. This certificate from Colorado, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state and that is annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the state purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Colorado seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of the state of Delaware, received nine votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received nine votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote to the state of Colorado that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none. This certificate from Connecticut, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be returned from the state, and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of that state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Connecticut seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of the state of Delaware received seven votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received seven votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the state of Connecticut that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Yeah. 
Hearing none. This certificate from Delaware, the parliamentarians advised me, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be returned from the state, and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the state purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Delaware seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden, Jr., of the state of Delaware received three votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received three votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the state of Delaware that the tellers verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? None. Hearing none. This certificate from the District of Columbia, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from the district that purports to be a return from the district and has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the district purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the District of Columbia seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware received three votes for president and Kamala D. Harris from the state of California received three votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the District of Columbia that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Mm. Hearing none. This certificate from Florida, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be returned from the state and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Florida seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received 29 votes for president, and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received 29 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of Florida that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Georgia, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be a return from the state and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Georgia seems to be regular in form and authentic. And it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware received 16 votes for president and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received 16 votes for vice president. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia rise? Mr. President, myself, members of the Georgia delegation and some 74 of my Republican colleagues and I object to the electoral votes from the state of Georgia on the grounds that the election conducted on November 3rd was faulty and fraudulent due to, un, uh, due to unilateral actions by the Secretary of State to unlawfully change the state's election process without approval from the General Assembly and thereby setting the stage for an unprecedented amount of fraud and irregularities and I have signed the objection myself. Uh, sections 15 and 17 of Title III of the United States Code require that any objection be presented in writing and signed by a member of the House of Representatives and a senator. Is the objection in writing and signed by a member and a senator? President, prior to the actions and events of today, we did, but following the events of today, it appears that some senators have withdrawn their objection. In that case, the objection cannot be entertained. Section 18 of Title III of the United States Code moves it. This certificate from Hawaii, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state, and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of that state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. 
Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Hawaii seems to be regular in form and authentic. And it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware received four votes for president and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received four votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote from the state of Hawaii that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Idaho, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Idaho seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received four votes for president, and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received four votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote from the state of Idaho that the teller has verified appear to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Illinois, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be returned from the state, and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of that state purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Illinois seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden, Jr., of the state of Delaware received 20 votes for president and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received 20 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the state of Illinois that the teller has verified appears to be in regular form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Indiana the parliamentarians advise me is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be returned from the state and that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of that state purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Indiana seems to be regular in form and authentic. And it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received 11 votes for president and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received 11 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the state of Indiana that the teller has verified? It appears to be regular in form and authentic. Hearing none. This certificate from Iowa, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Iowa seems to be regular in form and authentic. And it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received six votes for president and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received six votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of Iowa that the teller has verified? It appears to be regular and authentic. Hearing none, this certificate from Kansas, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be returned from the state and that has annexed to it a certificate of authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Kansas seems to be regular in form and authentic. It appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received six votes for president and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received six votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of Kansas that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none. This certificate from the Commonwealth of Kentucky, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be a return from the state, has annexed to it a certificate of authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the Commonwealth of Kentucky seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received eight votes for president 
and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received eight votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the Commonwealth of Kentucky? That the teller is verified appears to be regular in form and authentic. Hearing none, this certificate from Louisiana, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from that state. It purports to be returned from the state, has annexed to it a certificate of authority from the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Louisiana seems to be regular in form and authentic and appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received eight votes for president and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received eight votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the state of Louisiana? That the teller is verified to be regular in form and authentic. Hearing none, this certificate from Maine, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be returned from the state that has annexed to it a certificate of authority from the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Maine seems to be regular in form and authentic. And it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware received three votes for president and Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received one vote for president and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received three votes for vice president and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received one vote for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of Maine that the teller has verified it appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Maryland, the parliamentarians advise me is the only certificate of vote from that state, purports to be returned from the state, has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Maryland seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware received 10 votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received 10 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the state of Maryland that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from that state, purports to be a return from the state and has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts seems to be regular in form and authentic. And it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware received 11 votes for president and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received 11 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? The tellers advised appear to be regular in form and authentic. Hearing none, this certificate from Michigan, the parliamentarians advise is the only certificate of vote in that state. It purports to be a return from the state and has annexed to it a certificate of authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Michigan seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware received 16 votes for president and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received 16 votes for vice president. For what reason does the gentlelady from Georgia rise? Mr. President, I, along with 70 of my Republican colleagues, object to the counting of the electoral votes for the state of Michigan on the grounds that the error rate precedes the FEC rate allowed at 0.0008% and that the people who signed affidavits at risk of perjury, their voices have not been heard in a court of law. Uh, Section 15 and 17 of Title III of the U.S. Code require that any objection be presented in writing and signed by a member of the House of Representatives and a senator. Is the objection in writing and signed by a member and a senator? 
The objection is writing, not signed by a senator. In that case, the objection cannot be entertained. Are there any further objections to counting the certificate of the vote from the state of Michigan? The certificate that Taylor has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic. Hearing no further objections, this certificate from Minnesota, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be returned from the state, annexed to its certificate of authority from the state purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Minnesota seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware received 10 votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received 10 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the state of Minnesota that the tellers verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Mississippi, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be a return from the state as annexed to it a certificate of authority of the state purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Mississippi seems to be regular in form and authentic. And it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received six votes for president and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received six votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote from the state of Mississippi that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none. This certificate from Missouri, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state, that has annexed to it a certificate from an authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Missouri seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received 10 votes for president, and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received 10 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the state of Missouri that the tellers verified appears to be regular and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Montana, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state, and that has annexed to it a certificate of authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Montana seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received three votes for president, and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received three votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the vote of the state of Montana that the teller verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Nebraska, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state that has annexed to it a certificate of authority from the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Nebraska seems to be regular in form and authentic. And it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received four votes for president and Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware received one vote for president and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received four votes for vice president and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received one vote for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote from the state of Nebraska that the tellers verified regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Nevada, the parliamentarian advises, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state and that has annexed to it a certificate of authority from the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Nevada seems to be regular in form and authentic. And it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr. 
of the state of Delaware received six votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received six votes for vice president. For what reason does the gentleman from Alabama rise? Mr. President, I and 55 other members of the United States House of Representatives object to the electoral votes of the state of Nevada in order to protect the lawful votes of Nevada and all other American citizens. Section 15 and 17 of Title III of the United States Code requires that any objection be presented in writing and signed by a member of the House of Representatives and a senator. Is the objection in writing and signed by a member and a senator? Mr. President, it is in writing, but unfortunately, no United States senator has joined in this effort. In that case, the objection cannot be entertained. Are there any further objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of Nevada that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? This certificate from New Hampshire, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be a return from the state, has annexed to it a certificate of authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of New Hampshire seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of the state of Delaware received four votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received four votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of New Hampshire that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? This certificate from New Jersey, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return from the state, has annexed to it a certificate of authority in the state, purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of New Jersey seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of the state of Delaware received 14 votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received 14 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of New Jersey? Tellers verified appears to be regular in form and authentic. This certificate from New Mexico, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from the state. It purports to be a return from the state, and that is annexed to it a certificate of authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of New Mexico seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden, Jr. of the state of Delaware received five votes for president and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received five votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of the state of New Mexico that the teller has verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from New York, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be returned from the state, has annexed to it a certificate of authority from the state, to purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of New York seems to be regular in form and authentic. And it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware received 29 votes for president and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received 29 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of New York that the tellers verified appears to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from North Carolina, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from that state that purports to be a return from the state, has annexed to it a certificate from the state purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of North Carolina seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received 15 votes for president and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received 15 votes 
for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of North Carolina? If the teller is verified, appears to be regular in form and authentic. This certificate from North Dakota, the parliamentarians advise me, is the only certificate of vote from the state. It purports to be a return from the state that has annexed to it a certificate of authority of the state purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of North Dakota seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received three votes for president, and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received three votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of North Dakota that the teller is verified as regular and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Ohio, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from the state. It purports to be a return from the state, has annexed to it a certificate of authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Ohio seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received 18 votes for president and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received 18 votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote from the state of Ohio that the teller has verified as regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Oklahoma, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from that state, purports to be a return from the state, has annexed to it a certificate of authority of the state purporting to appoint or ascertain electors. Uh, Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Oklahoma seems to be regular in form and authentic. And it appears therefrom that Donald J. Trump of the state of Florida received seven votes for president and Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana received seven votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of Oklahoma that the teller has verified to be regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from Oregon, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be returned from the state, has a certificate of authority from the state annexed to it to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the state of Oregon seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware received seven votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received seven votes for vice president. Are there any objections to counting the certificate of vote of the state of Oregon that the teller has verified as regular in form and authentic? Hearing none, this certificate from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the parliamentarians advise, is the only certificate of vote from the state that purports to be a return to the state, has annexed to it a certificate from an authority in the state purporting to appoint and ascertain electors. Mr. President, the certificate of the electoral vote of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania seems to be regular in form and authentic, and it appears therefrom that Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware received 20 votes for president, and Kamala D. Harris of the state of California received 20 votes for vice president. For what reason does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? Mr. President, sadly but resolutely, I object to the electoral votes of my beloved Commonwealth of Pennsylvania on the grounds of multiple constitutional infractions that they were not, under all of the known circumstances, regularly given. And on this occasion, I have a written objection signed by a senator and 80 members of the House of Representatives. Yeah. Is the objection in writing and signed by a senator? Yes, Mr. President, it is. An objection presented in writing and signed by both a representative and a senator complies with the law. Chapter 1, Title 3 of the United States Code. The clerk will report the objection. We, a United States Senator and members of the House of Representatives, object to the counting of the electoral votes of the state of Pennsylvania on the ground that they were not 
under all of the known circumstances regularly given. Signed, Josh Harley, United States Senator, Scott Perry, Member of Congress. Are there further objections to the certificates from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? The chair hears none. The two houses will withdraw from joint session. Each house will deliberate separately on the pending objection and report its decision back to the joint session. The Senate will now retire to its chamber. And you're watching live coverage on C-SPAN of the Electoral College certification by the Congress. This was a joint session by the House and Senate. There have been objections throughout the evening, including to Georgia, Nevada, and Michigan. However, both a representative and a senator need to sign those objections to the certification if they want to debate it. Those did not have Senate signatures. Pennsylvania had a Senate signature and 80 House members. So the Senate is going back on the other side of the Capitol to the Senate chamber. The House will debate the Pennsylvania certification. The Senate will debate the Pennsylvania certification. You'll watch live coverage of the Senate on C-SPAN 2 and the House on C-SPAN. After that, there are still 12 states to get through. There are no predicted objections to those 12 states. Throughout the evening now, we're going to be taking your calls, getting your reaction to today's events up at the Capitol and also the certification process. This is live coverage on C-SPAN. Now back to the House.
The House will be in order pursuant to Senate Concurrent Resolution 1. The House will be in order. Thank you. Pursuant to Second Senate Concurrent Resolution 1 and Section 17 of Title III, United States Code, when the two houses withdraw from the joint Senate session to count the electoral vote for separate consideration of an objection, a representative may speak to the objection for five minutes and not more than once. Debate shall not exceed two hours, after which the chair shall put the question, shall the objection be agreed to? The clerk will report the objection made in joint session. We, a United States Senator and members of the House of Representatives, object to the counting of the electoral votes of the state of Pennsylvania on the ground that they were not, under all of the known circumstances, regularly given. Signed, Josh Howley and Scott Perry. The chair will endeavor to alternate recognition between members speaking in support of the objection and members speaking in opposition to the objection. Uh, before I recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, the House will be in order. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Perry, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is a somber day for the defense of the Constitution. See, the Constitution is just a piece of paper. It cannot defend itself. That is why our leaders swear an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution, and that's what I'm doing here this evening. The Constitution states the times, place, and manner of holding elections shall be prescribed by the legislature, not the courts, not the governor, not the secretary of state or other bureaucrats or elected officials, the legislature. In Pennsylvania, the Supreme Court unilaterally extended the deadline for ballots to three days after the election. They actually wanted 10. The Supreme Court is not the legislature. The Supreme Court mandated unpostmarked ballots to be received destroying the validity of all the votes that were cast timely. The Supreme Court action defied the law, the legislature, and the will of the people. The Supreme Court authorized the use of drop boxes where ballot harvesting could occur. The legislature never authorized that form of voting, and the court had absolutely no right to do so. Responding to the Secretary of State, Kathy Bookvar, the Supreme Court ruled that mail-in ballots need not authenticate signatures. Once again, the court not only defied the Constitution and the will of the people, but by so doing, they created a separate class of voters, thereby violating the Equal Protections Clause prescribed in the Constitution. How can we have two legally separate classes of voters? Yet the court made it so, not the legislature. The Constitution doesn't mention the court when determining the time, place, and manner of elections, because they're not authorized to make those decisions, and yet they did it. And the U.S. Supreme Court has refused to hear the case denying the evidence and denying the demands for justice from the people of Pennsylvania and America. These aren't my opinions. These aren't partisan viewpoints. These are irrefutable facts. Six days before the election, guidance emailed from the Secretary of State required that counties shall not pre-canvass or canvass any mail-in or civilian absentee ballots received between 8 o'clock Tuesday and 5 o'clock Friday, and that they must be kept separately. That was six days before the election. Two days before the election, county received new guidance from the Secretary of State informing counties that they shall canvas segregated absentee and mail-in ballots as soon as possible upon receipt. The Secretary of State is not elected by the people. She is not a member of the legislature, yet she, and she alone, determine the time and manner of elections. Unconstitutional, ladies and gentlemen, in defiance of a U.S. Supreme Court order that all ballots received after Election Day be segregated, the Secretary of State knew once they were canvassed, that is, opened and commingled with all the other ballots, they would be counted with all the rest. And what's the remedy for this defiance, for this law-breaking? So far, the court has decided there is no remedy. There is no penalty for this lawlessness, this dilution of lawless, of lawfully cast votes, this defiance of the Constitution, 
no remedy. When the state legislature requested the governor convene a special session to address the unanswered questions and try and provide a remedy, he refused. When votes are accepted under unconstitutional means without fair and equal protection for all, the only result can be an illegitimate outcome. Illegitimate. The voters did not create this mess, but the will of the people is absolutely being subverted by the deliberate and willful actions of individuals defying their oath, the law, and the Constitution. In Pennsylvania, we use the statewide uniform registry of electors, or the SURE system, as the basis of determining who can vote. Unfortunately, a recent attempted audit by the Democrat State Auditor General concluded that he was unable unable to establish with any degree of reasonable assurance that the SURE system is secure and that Pennsylvania voter registration records are complete and accurate. That's what we're relying on, ladies and gentlemen, that right there. This is the very same system used to certify the election in the contest for President of the United States. This is the very same system that the state used to certify the 2020 election even though its figures do not match more than half of Pennsylvania's 67 counties. To this day, right now while we stand here, how can this election be certified using a system that after two months still displays that over 205,000 more votes were cast in Pennsylvania than people who voted in the November election? Let me say that again. 205,000 more votes than voters. Time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Colorado seek recognition? Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise in opposition to the objection. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Madam Speaker, to my colleague from Pennsylvania, I will say this. I carry the same Constitution that you do. And the Constitution, sir, does not allow you, me, or any member of this body to substitute our judgment for that of the American people. It does not allow us to disregard the will of the American people. Because under this Constitution, under our Constitution, Congress doesn't choose the President. The American people do. And they have chosen in resounding numbers, as every single member of this body well understands. Now, I have been at a loss, Madam Speaker, to explain what happened today, but there's a statement that I found that largely summarized my thoughts on the matter. The scenes of mayhem unfolding at the seat of our nation's government are a sickening and heartbreaking sight. This is how election results are disputed in a banana republic, not our democratic republic. I am appalled by the reckless behavior of some political leaders since the election and by the lack of respect shown today for our institutions, our traditions, and our law enforcement. The violent assault on the Capitol and the disruption of a constitutionally mandated meeting of Congress was undertaken by people whose passions have been inflamed by falsehoods and false hopes. Insurrection could do grave damage to our nation and our reputation. In the United States of America, it is the fundamental responsibility of every patriotic citizen to support the rule of law. To those who are disappointed in the results of the election, our country is more important than the politics of the moment. Those are not my words. Those are the words of former Republican President George W. Bush. To my colleagues, it is after midnight tonight. It's been a long day for our country, a long day for our republic. Let us dispense with this. Let's do the right thing. Let's honor our oath. Let's certify the results, and let's get back to the work of the American people. And with that, I yield to the distinguished chairwoman, Chairwoman Lofgren. Madam Speaker, our duty today is significant but straightforward. We must count the votes of the electors as cast in the Electoral College and announce the results. As discussed, our roles and responsibilities are established by the Constitution and federal law, and they're clear. The facts before us are also clear. Pennsylvania submitted one slate of electors as chosen by the voters of the state. The slate was certified according to state law. Now those lawful results must be counted and announced. Despite this information and any number of false claims that you may have heard, including here today, as former Attorney General Barr said, 
quote, we've not seen fraud on a scale that could have affected a different outcome in the election. This is not simply a conclusory statement. The results of the election have been litigated. The record is clear. The lawsuits challenging the election results failed. They failed because there's simply no evidence to support these baseless claims. You know, it's one thing to tweet a belief, quite another to provide actual evidence. These cases fail because there is no evidence. Judges ruled in the lawsuit that the 2020 election was sound. So it should come as no surprise that Republican office holders have recognized the election results as legitimate and accurately determined in an election that was conducted safely, securely, and with integrity. We all take an oath to support and defend the Constitution. And as we near the end of the task before us, let's remember the beginning of the Constitution. Before Article II and the 12th Amendment, which spell out the Electoral College, and before Article I, which creates Congress, the Constitution begins with the preamble. The preamble is short and bold. We, the people. The people spoke in historic numbers. Their votes have been counted. Their choice is clear. It's time, as the law requires, to announce the state of the people's vote. The violence and disorder inflicted on our democracy by seditious rioters today is an indication of why adherence to our Constitution is so vital. I urge all of us to stand up for law, for democracy, for our Constitution, and to stand up for America and reject this objection. And I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman's time has expired. What purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I rise to support the objection. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. A day that was intended to debate the importance of election integrity and the rule of law tragically became a day that will be a black mark in our nation's history. Nevertheless, the work of this House must go on as America will go on. We must all sincerely thank the Capitol Police and Metro Police for their selfless actions today, putting their safety and lives on the line to protect, protect this House. The lawlessness and violence of today must be condemned, just as all violent protests must be condemned. Nevertheless, the fact remains, a large number of Pennsylvanians are enormously frustrated with actions taken by elected and appointed officials in Pennsylvania, which have led to a high level of distrust for this past election. We have the United States Constitution, which is the reason we have been and will continue to be a great country and a country of laws. The U.S. Constitution is unambiguous, Madam Speaker, in declaring that state legislators are the entity with the authority to set election procedures and to enact any changes to election law. Article 1, Section 4, Clause 1 states the times, places, and manner of holding elections shall be prescribed in each state by the legislator thereof. The authority of election procedures lies with the state legislator, period. In Pennsylvania, this authority was indisputably usurped by the Pennsylvania's governor's office, by the Pennsylvania Secretary of State, and by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. These unlawful actions include, but are not limited to, accepting ballots past 8 p.m. on election day, inconsistent application of verified signature requirements for in-person ballots versus mail-in ballots, authorizing the curing of mail-in ballots with less than 24 hours notice, leading to inconsistent preparedness between counties, and authorizing the use of unsecured drop boxes, which is not permitted in statute. If such unlawful actions are to be accepted, why do we what do we have to look forward to next year? The Pennsylvania Secretary of State allowing online voting because it may be raining in Philadelphia? It was a free-for-all. Madam Speaker, it was back in 2005 when then-minority leader Pelosi, while leading 31 Democrats as they objected to the presidential elector certification, as they did in the last three uh, presidential elections when a Republican won, and stated quite well, actually, that the members of Congress have brought this challenge and are speaking up for their aggrieved constituents many of whom have been disenfranchised in this process. This is their only opportunity to have this debate while the country is listening, and is it appropriate to do so? Thank you for those words, Madam Speaker. They were appropriate then, as they are now. 
If there is an American ideal that all citizens, regardless of party affiliation, can agree upon, it is that we must have election integrity, integrity. We should not certify these electors, which were derived by unlawful actions and a result of inaccurate vote tallies. I yield the remainder of my time to Representative Joyce. You have to stay standing. Madam, Madam Speaker, stay stand. I rise in support of the objection. Tonight, my heart is heavy as we consider the dark acts that transpired in this chamber today. But Madam Speaker, the American people can be assured that violent and irrational attacks on this body cannot derail the constitutional responsibility that lies in front of us. This has always been about upholding the law. It's always been about protecting government of, by, and for the people. <laughs> Preserving the rule of law is more important than ever. We must acknowledge that unconstitutional acts unduly impacted the presidential election in Pennsylvania. Contrary to law, the Supreme Court extended the deadline for mail-in ballots for three days beyond the election day. Contrary to law, the Secretary of the Commonwealth discarded mail-in ballot signature verification safeguards. These leaders took advantage of a deadly pandemic and seized the state's legislature's rightful authority. I took an oath to uphold the law and defend the Constitution. I pledged to protect free and fair elections. I cannot in good faith certify electors that were selected under an unlawful process. I will object to the Electoral College certification to protect the will of Pennsylvania voters, to uphold the law, to restore trust in our electoral system, and ultimately to save our Constitution. At Gettysburg, which is in my district, President Abraham Lincoln spoke about the great task of, of ensuring government by, of, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Thank you, I'm and I yield. Expired. Thank you. What purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I rise in opposition. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes without objection. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Nearly seven million Pennsylvanians showed up to vote in the 2020 elections. They cast their votes for Democrats and Republicans up and down the ballot, including the entire U.S. House delegation, the entire state House, and half of the state Senate, and other state and local races. Since the election, there have been allegations of widespread election fraud in Pennsylvania. But remarkably, the 20 suits filed by the Trump campaign, Pennsylvania Republicans, and others challenging the results in Pennsylvania have never claimed that there was voter fraud. Perhaps that's because attorneys can lose their license when they make unsubstantiated claims in court. That's where the rubber really meets the road. So, if these lawsuits didn't claim election fraud, what did they claim? Most of the legal challenges to the presidential election in Pennsylvania question relatively small numbers of ballots that were allegedly tainted by technical violations. Even assuming that all these ballots had been cast for Joe Biden, throwing them out wouldn't have changed the result of the election. Now, one exception is the lawsuit filed by one of our colleagues from Pennsylvania, Kelly versus Commonwealth, which would have thrown out all the mail-in votes cast in the 2020 general election on the grounds that Act 77, the state law allowing those votes, was unconstitutional. That suit would have disenfranchised two and a half million Pennsylvanians. Let's let that sink in. Two and a half million Pennsylvanians would have had their votes nullified. Now, I want to provide my colleagues with some background about the state law at the heart of this challenge. In 2019, the Republican-controlled state legislature approved Act 77, a bipartisan bill to reform the state's election laws, which instituted no-excuse mail balloting. Act 77 was supported almost unanimously 
by Republicans in the State House and State Senate. In fact, it was unanimous in the State Senate and all but two Republicans in the State House. Moreover, once this act was passed, Act 77 had a 120-day period where challenges could be filed against the act if people thought it was unconstitutional. Well, four months went by, nobody files a challenge. In June 3rd, Pennsylvania had their primary under this new system. Nobody challenged the primary election. It was only challenged in November when Republicans didn't get the result they wanted at the top of the ticket. Not surprisingly, this case was dismissed by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court was denied. Another exception is Texas versus Pennsylvania. They asked the court to reject the results of the Pennsylvania contest, the presidential contest in Pennsylvania and several other states, disenfranchising tens of millions of voters. Seven Republican members of the Pennsylvania U.S. House delegation signed the U.S. House Republican brief in support of Texas versus Pennsylvania. Well, I feel compelled to point out to my colleagues that the same voters who sent them to the 117th Congress cast their votes for the president by marking the very same ballots, which were read by the very same ballot scanners and monitored by the very same election workers. Yet our colleagues who signed the brief only want to invalidate the presidential votes. This is illogical and inconsistent, colleagues, and I'm pleased to note that the Supreme Court rejected it as well. The fact is, the election has received unprecedented scrutiny in the courts. I believe it's irresponsible and undemocratic to argue today that the U.S. Congress ought to relitigate the 2020 presidential election and second-guess the will of the voters in multiple states, the decisions of numerous state and federal courts, including the Supreme Court, and the counts and recounts conducted by state election officials. There were 20 lawsuits filed in Pennsylvania challenging aspects of the Pennsylvania presidential election. In 19 of them, you got laughed out of court. The one case you won affected roughly 100 votes. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris won by over 80,000. The gentleman's time has expired. I yield back. What, uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I rise to support the objection. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes for that objection. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise this evening with a heavy heart. The violence that occurred today at the U.S. Capitol was senseless, destructive, and counter to our American values. This past Sunday, each member of this body took an oath to uphold the United States Constitution. And while the path of least resistance, particularly following today's events, would be remaining silent, my oath to uphold the Constitution does not permit me to maintain silence. While systemic voter fraud was not something proven, we've witnessed a systemic failure in the application of Pennsylvania's voting law when it comes to the 2020 general election. In late 2019, the Commonwealth revisited and modernized its election law with the Bipartisan Act 77. Granted, in late 2019, the Commonwealth legislature did not have the foresight to anticipate how COVID-19 would present challenges to voting. Despite that, it is not up to the governor, the secretary of the Commonwealth, nor the state Supreme Court to unilaterally create law. The election abuses to Pennsylvania Act 77 taken by the Pennsylvania executive branch and upheld by the Pennsylvania judicial branch were clearly unconstitutional and had an obvious, if not measured, impact on the 2020 election, particularly when it comes to the citizens' faith in the electoral process. Irregularities in Pennsylvania included uneven application of the law, ballot curing, ignoring signature validation requirements, using unsecured drop boxes, accepting ballots beyond the deadlines, and interfering with certified poll watcher access among others. These actions were taken by the Commonwealth's Governor and Secretary of State, while the Pennsylvania Supreme Court circumvented the authority of the state legislature. Furthermore, the Chief Law Officer of the Commonwealth sat idly while this process unfolded. Now, I join many of my colleagues in Pennsylvania requesting the legislators in Harrisburg 
conduct an investigation and audit to ensure such negligence will be prevented in future elections. I have serious concerns about how these irregularities in the application of the Commonwealth's election laws will play in future elections. Only with equal application of the law will the voters of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania have certainty in their election processes. Now, I remain committed to ensuring the voters receive an electoral system they deserve and where equal application of the law is guaranteed. If our election integrity is compromised, we have failed the very voters who have sent us here to defend the Constitution. I yield the remaining, my remaining time to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Harris. Thank you very much. I, ask, I thank the gentleman for yielding. The oath I took is very simple. Madam Speaker, you administer it. It's to support and defend the Constitution. Now, as you walk back to the office buildings, you walk by that wall that has when the various states accepted that Constitution. And remember, when a state accepts the Constitution, it agrees to accept every part of the Constitution. It doesn't get to pick and choose. Pennsylvania was there when it was written. They were so enthusiastic about the Constitution, they approved it in 1787. My state, Maryland, is a little further down the wall, 1788. They were there when it was written. The clause that gave the legislature the power over the elections was there when they accepted it. It's been there since. How dare the judicial branch or the executive branch of that state usurp the legislative authority? That's a clear violation of the Constitution. Now, we heard there's no evidence. Evidence? The Pennsylvania Supreme Court unilaterally extended the deadline to receive absentee and mail-in ballots. Does anybody contest that over here? Does it say the legislature did that? No, it doesn't. It says the court did it. That's a violation. That's what the Texas lawsuit was all about. We disadvantage other states when states like Pennsylvania, the executive branch and judicial branch, cheat on the Constitution. And that's what they did here. But there's more evidence but wait, there's more. The Democrat Secretary of the Commonwealth eroded integrity by dismissing signature authentication on a ballot. Does anyone here believe the Pennsylvania legislature would have agreed to create a separate system for mail-in ballots and in-person ballots? That if you mail it in, you don't need a signature? But if you vote in person, you do, and it has to be authenticated? Of course not. The legislature clearly wouldn't have agreed to that. But that didn't stop the usurpation of constitutional authority. Madam Chair, I vigorously support this objection, and I ask unanimous consent to enter to the record the objection to counting the electoral votes of the state of Gentlemen, Arizona additional signers. Without objection. Without Madam objection. Chair, my motion is Without the objection. Table. Thank you. Thank you. What purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I rise in opposition. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Madam Speaker, tonight we will not be picking the president. For the people did that on November 3rd. Rather, tonight in this House, we will decide whether American democracy survives. Let us be under no illusion. These are the stakes. If this objection succeeds, and the will of seven million Pennsylvania voters is cast aside, it will be the end of our representative democracy. Now, there is no reasonable debate about what happened in this election in Pennsylvania. Seven million Pennsylvanians voted. Joe Biden won by over 81,000 votes. This was certified in 67 counties by bar bipartisan local elected officials including Republicans, and every single court, whether the judge is a Democrat or a Republican, has reaffirmed this outcome. The objectors, however, claim we do not know the will of the people because the election in Pennsylvania was somehow conducted corruptly.